All right. Well, welcome uh, for those who are watching this or listening to this or even just reading and uh, somehow able to lip read. Um, this is hopefully going to be a relatively brief presentation um, on ICU for non-intensivists. So, and I am an uncle with computers, bear with me. Um, ASA uh, asked me uh, a few days ago, to try and put together a presentation on the very fundamentals of what happens in an ICU. Um, and this is intended to give you a starting point and no more. And as you know, the ASA support, represent and educate. And one of the things they are hoping to do is put together some resources for those of you who are going to be um, hopefully and or unfortunately working in ICUs very soon. So we want you um, is the title of this presentation and it's how to prepare for the end of the world working in ICU after all these years. Now, for those who do know me, um, my name is Max Moser. I'm an ICU specialist uh, at Eastern Health and the Bays, amongst other places. Um, and if you do know me, you know that I always have to put a uh, Monty Python slide in. And given that this is a very well-worn, well-used slide, I thought I'd use it again, because in this situation, uh, nobody does expect the Spanish Inquisition, except for those that do. And they told us about it. But that's another story. And there are so many memes out there, I thought I'd better put a couple up. Um, not to waste your time, um, you can flick back to them if you want later on, but simply to remind you that we need to try to maintain a sense of humour and kindness amongst all of this uh, with the community, but particularly with other staff members uh, as you will start to function in ICUs. So who am I? I say my name is Max, I'm an intensivist. Um, I always love the comment about I have nothing to declare. I don't know what to declare in this sort of situation. Um, certainly I'm not paid by anyone for this. Um, I do have an affinity for anaesthetists. Uh, those who know me, I know my wife is an anaesthetist. Um, I have a fairly significant background in education. I've done some postgraduate training in this area. Um, and certainly have a passion for it, particularly in the simulation uh, zone. Um, but bottom line is I'm really just an intensivist. And I want you to understand that just like in anaesthetics, there are different ways of doing things. What I'm gonna say here is just one way uh, and mostly my way of doing things. Um, and mostly what I put down um, late at night after doing all the work um, for all the other preparations. So please take this with a grain of salt, but do use this as a starting point if you'd like to. And if you're reading this, that's great because that means you're here uh, to learn something or to remind yourself or hopefully just have a laugh at myself. So why you? Um, your skill set is the obvious answer. Um, as an ethicist and potentially other specialists who may be watching this or senior trainees, um, everyone has the ability to do intensive care um, and everyone has the ability to do it well. Obviously, it can take some time to get there, um, but with a little bit of prep work, you can certainly become very capable very quickly as an anaesthetist um, with all your procedural skills, but particularly because most, if not all of you, will have done some ICU in the past, um, and there are a lot of similarities um, between what we do in ICU and what you do. Um, this is going to be career-defining, this event, for all of us. You probably know this already. You've probably been reading all sorts of articles, all sorts of feeds, both mainstream media, uh, work social media, um, work apps, work WhatsApps, Slacks, whatever it is. Um, so you know this already, but I can't stress this enough. This is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime event, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which way you look at it, and I certainly look at it <laughs> the latter. Um, but there are some opportunities to be gained by this. Um, hopefully building better communication lines between craft groups, um, hopefully building better communication lines between specialties across the world, as we've already seen happening um, with a lot of the articles and evidence and research and even equipment that has been rapidly developed um, in Asia and Europe. So what is this presentation not? It is not a COVID how-to. I can't stress that enough. There is so much information on COVID out there uh, and the management. I will certainly touch on it in this presentation, but I also want to make sure that this has a little bit of the day-to-day -day stuff for you. It's not going to be a 30 minute on how to become an intensivist in the same way 30 minutes wouldn't make you an anaesthetist. But I hope it gives you some starting points and some resources um, to go to after this. I will also stress that um, due to time constraints, this will probably be a one-off production at this point in time. Um, if I can, I will update it as more information comes to light with COVID. Um, but at the moment, it's the 29th um, of March. Um, this is the second time through I'm trying to do this. This is my second edit. Um, and I've tried to keep things as updated as possible. So what is this? 
Well, hopefully this is a very brief refresher on what you can do now, hopefully before the storm has hit your ICU or before the big part of the storm has hit the ICU. Um, a little bit on the ICU environment. Um, the big part of this talk will be on the ward round basics and routine. End of life care, goals of care and wellbeing is a really important part. Um, and I do want to touch on that briefly. And I will obviously talk on some of the very basics of COVID management. More importantly, I'll give you some links uh, to some of the important resources out there. So the question is, what can you do now? Well, for me, I think one of the most important things is communication. Uh, we all say that, we all know it. Um, but go and talk to your ICU team now if you haven't already um, and make sure the hospital execs are involved. And I say this as most big hospitals will all be on top of this and doing these sorts of things. And most small hospitals will, will as well, but some places won't have started this or won't be as far down the path as they need to be. And I can't stress enough that the intensive care consultant, if you have one in your hospital even, they're not gonna be able to do all this by themselves. They're not gonna be able to get all the education resources up, source all the equipment and make sure the staff are ready. And they are going to need your help in moving this forward. Importantly as well, you need to understand your learning methods. So I've put a video up with this um, at the request of ASA. I hate talking. Um, on video, um, but I understand that some people need to have a talking head. Um, maybe you need the talking head, maybe you need the slides, maybe you need a big textbook, but remember to go and look up, uh, to, to revise things in best fit your learning method. Do read up though, there are links at this end of the presentation, but I'm gonna stress this, beware of information overload. There are so many resources out there coming thick and fast, updated sometimes even hourly, um, that I can't keep up with in any of any of the, the, the new updates for certain ones, and I can't keep up with a lot of it. And I can't stress this enough, try to find two or three good sources of truth, if you can call it that, um, and use them regularly. And as I mentioned before, one of my big passions in education is simulation and, and practicing. Um, I don't think it's the only way of learning, but I think it's a really important way. Um, and the ANZICS guidelines strongly recommend, well, I believe strongly, I better not quote them on that, but they certainly recommend practicing and simulating. Um, and we've already been doing that in the workplaces I um, practice at, and that is running a simulation, for example, on how to tube a patient that has coronavirus, how to run a code blue simulation, how to run a code blue in a COVID scenario, how to prone a patient, and I'll come on to proning in a moment. But please practice in your own places, even if it's just donning and doffing PPE. So what about the ICU environment? Well, go and look now. In the same way when you go to a new hospital as an anaesthetist or as a specialist in whatever area you work in, you're not just gonna walk up and, and try and start practicing your daily routine of care for your patients without knowing something about the environment. So go to the ICU, go to the wards, have a look around. Maybe even shadow a ward round. We're strongly encouraging that in my workplaces, um, getting people in, uh, maybe in their spare time, but hopefully in paid time, um, to come in and shadow a ward round, shadow um, the intensivist and on how he or she does it. Um, and get a feel for how that unit, your unit in your space will operate. Um, from an equipment point of view, I mean, I'm sure all of you have done this many times in the past when you work in a new hospital, but you wanna know where the crash cart is, where the difficult airway trolley is. Do you have them in your hospital? Um, because in the heat of the moment, you don't wanna be searching through for that bougie or searching through for the adrenaline when you don't know where it is on the trolley. This is a really obvious one, but make sure you check where the facilities are um, that you need as a person. You know, where's the toilets? Is there a staff room? What's the isolation protocols in the staff room? Um, is there a place to leave your bag? Where, where can you don and doff um, your own clothes, your work clothes going in, in and out? And probably the most important thing is, is who are the staff in the unit? Go and meet the nurse unit manager or the assistant nurse unit manager. Meet the junior medical staff. Touch base with the allied health. In, in ICU, allied health are absolutely essential for a well-functioning unit. I can't stress enough. Know your ward clerk. Know them by name. Um, because they'll, have, they'll be a wonderful source of information. Right, so this is the long bit. Basics of the ward round. So what do I do on a normal clinical day? Well, it varies um, on how much coffee I've had. Um, but I really am passionate about doing a huddle at the start of the day. Now, obviously, this huddle will be at 1.5 metres or with Vimeo or with uh, Zoom or some other option. Um, but you need to have the key JMOs, um, the key nurse in charge of the unit, plus minus some senior allied health, um, to work out how many patients you've got at the start of the day, how many are waiting in ED to come up, how many are on the wards that need review and or to be brought down, how many theatre cases are there, because there'll still be theatre cases happening even during the coronavirus, um, how, much, uh, how many staff members are off sick, both 
particularly nursing and medical staff? And how can you fill those gaps? Now, ideally, this huddle should only take five minutes at most, um, but it is an essential start to having a plan for the day, particularly for anaesthetists who've done um, in charge of the, the floor for the day, you'll know how important this sort of thing is. Now, handover. Handover traditionally uh, in my workplace would be between the junior doctors, senior doctors and the nursing staff. And we sit around a table, uh, look at results and talk things through about each and every patient. But obviously this, is, this model is going to be changing as coronavirus hits. And it may well be that you do a walk around. I know a lot of intensive cares do a walk around handover by the patient bedside. It may be that you break into small groups um, and certain doctors and nurses take responsibility for small groups of patients. But either way, whichever way it is, you need to work out in your hospital fairly quickly how your handover is gonna run um, so that you can hit the ground running. Um, you need to know, after you've done your huddle, you'll know that there are potentially one, two, 10, 100 urgent patient reviews, and you need to allocate some people who can go off and help with those reviews. And then the ward round, and I'll come on to that um, in more detail momentarily. Um, but at the end, don't forget a good summary and a post round huddle um, so that you can allocate tasks. There's nothing worse than everyone breaking off and doing the same task and then realizing 10 minutes later you've all been trying to get hold of radiology. Don't forget your family and home teams. Now, in the current climate, uh, some work, some intensive cares have uh, unfortunately had to move towards um, telecommunications for family communications with their loved ones and with the staff. Um, and also even with home teams. So check what you're doing at the moment, but I can't stress enough, you need to touch base with home teams um, because the point at the bottom says, remember you may well be attending to a non-COVID patient. The home teams are still key in the management, um, particularly if you're having a lot of ICU experience. And I'll say this as well, if you have got some ICU experience. Um, and don't forget, just like when you do your doctor's ABC of an acute deteriorating patient, go back and reassess, continually go back and reassess your patients, your team, and how things progress. So what do you need for a round? Well, obviously you need some staff. And in my place, I like to have a junior medical officer, uh, particularly because I'm terrible at writing and or entering into an EMR computer systems. I'm a senior nurse, because they've usually got a very good handle of what's happening in that pod or that unit. Um, but allied health as well, pharmacists and physios particularly, but all of them are valuable. Now, again, in, in the oncoming storm of patients, we may not have enough pharmacists and physios to go around. So you may have to triage your patients as to who needs physio or pharmacy and most urgently. Um, but certainly there's always a new drug coming out that I don't know the brand name of. My pharmacist or my junior medical officer seems to know it far more than I do. Uh, make sure you've got enough equipment. So in some places uh, that are on EMR, a computer is essential. You can't enter notes, you can't check results without it. Other places it may be that there's paperwork, the nurses may have written down the blood results or they may be printed out. So make sure you know how to gather your information uh, and examining equipment. What are you going to be doing? A lot of places are no longer advocating doing chest examination, particularly with a stethoscope. Um, so work out how you're going to examine the patient, if at all. Who's going to do it? Are you going to nominate one person to examine the patient? But importantly, I can't stress this enough, you need to know how to obtain your information. Uh, again, the pathology may be on the computer, it may be paper-based. You need to know where this is and you may need to know where it is very quickly. What do you need to cover for each patient? Well, I'm sure some of you will be like me and brought up on Talion O'Connor, um, and it was always history examination. Well, in this case, I'd like to redefine history as information gathering. And that information gathering needs to be from a whole range of sources. The patient or the family themselves may have information, particularly for the more newly admitted patient, but even for those that have been in for a while. The bedside nurse particularly is fundamental to your information gathering because he or she has probably been there for some hours and we'll have far more insights, particularly into the trends that the patient is undergoing physiologically than anyone else will have. Um, where's the path table, as I mentioned before? And importantly as well, the ICU chart. Um, so in much the same way that an ethos will have an anesthetic chart in the middle of an operation, during an operation, um, we have an ICU chart. Now that might be on the computer. Um, my personal favorite, um, and I'll be shot by people who love AMR, is still having the paper one. Uh, one massive spread of paper on the desk outside the patient's bed space that is easily accessible and is easily visualised. Uh, graphing blood pressure changes, looking for urine output, looking for fluid balance, um, having some basic blood gases up there. But get familiar with your ICU chart quickly. I already briefly touched on this examination, um, but bear in mind things may change um, from the COVID, during the COVID era. era. Um, and most of you will have sat anaesthetic exams where you had to do short case examinations. Um, that's not necessarily going to be how things are done. Certainly not that everyone's going to be doing it. 
Uh, so make sure you have a plan for how and if you need to examine your patient. It may be that you have an ultrasound machine and someone is skilled at doing lung ultrasounds and that may become your way of examining the lungs. Um, but I can't stress this enough, have a plan in place. Now the two things I think are the most important when you're covering the patient, when you're doing everything you need to do with the patient, are the issues and plan. You need to formulate issues. Once upon a time, we would have called them problems, but apparently that's not PC anymore. Um, so issues, so it might be issue one, patient intubated, day three. Issue two, patient ventilated, SIMV mode, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you need to work out what your issues are uh, because that will then you help formulate your plan as to what you want to do. Issue one, intubated, day three, but looking ready to wean and extubate based on ventilation parameters and sedation. Plan, extubate later today under COVID guidelines. And importantly as well with both your issues and plan, I can't stress enough, having suffered enough as an, as an intensive care resident and registrar of the years, when you can't quite catch what the issue or plans are from the boss nurse or the boss doctor, um, everyone in the little group there at least as a minimum need to know it. Um, so they can go forth and make it happen. A stepwise approach can help with this history examination issues and plan. I'll go on to that now. So this unfortunately is not going to be a good slide and there is always one not good slide in a presentation. Um, this is simply an example of some of the things that are coming out now um, to help expedite the patient, the, the staff member who is not familiar with ICU. Um, and I'm hoping that ASA smart people will be able to put this up as a link at the end of this presentation uh, on the website. Um, but it is one way of approaching the very first initial hours to day management of a COVID patient. So what's my stepwise approach? Well, I'll go through these in detail. Um, and as you can see, I love starting off with an ABC approach, but I have put in bold at the bottom there goals of care. Again, I'm gonna stress this is fundamental um, to all patient care. So airway. I feel very nervous talking to particularly anaesthetists about airway because you know there's so much more than I do. Um, but some of the things, and not all, but some of the things I think are really important, you need to check how safe and secure your tube is, particularly if you're not wanting it to come out. Um, what's a cuff lick? Is there any? Um, how is it tied? Is it appropriate for your unit? Uh, importantly, at this point in time, in any patient, but particularly with a COVID patient, can the suction catheter pass? But the question you want to be asking yourself with airway is, can you extubate the patient? So, and, and amongst that, if it's greater than 10 days, and some people will say seven, and some people will say 14, some people will say three, is do you need to start considering a tracheostomy? And that will be partly your unit's um, policy. Um, and it may be that you have to help develop that policy. Breathing. So, AIMS. This, these numbers are partially based on COVID um, policies that have been coming out in various places. They're not necessarily what I would do for all patients. Normally I want my pH to be higher than 7.15, most definitely. But as a minimum, you should be aiming for that. Some people are advocating 7.2. Again, look at your guidelines. SATs or PAO2, we want to try and keep it around that 90% mark. As most of you be aware, you don't need to aim for 100%. Uh, in fact, if you're aiming for 100%, you may well be inducing um, hyperoxemic problems. Ideal body weight, tidal volume, six mils per kilo. Um, the ARDS net guidelines that came out about 10 years ago start off around eight and then titrate down. I'd suggest starting around six mils per kilo. PEEP, I'll come on to PEEP in a little bit, but by and large, unless you're looking to wean the patient, um, I'd be aiming for above eight, uh, equal to or above eight centimetres of water early on. Uh, and Play-Doh pressures, certainly you want to try and keep them under 30. Um, people will talk about driving pressures as well now. That's become uh, probably a more um, well, rec uh, well, certainly well accepted measurement of your high pressures um, but again look at what your hospital does and what its policies are on that so what happens if you're mandatorily ventilating a patient and they're referred to as less than 0.4 is the patient being weaned is probably the biggest question have they had a spontaneous breathing trial for example is their pressure support down to 10 and their peak down to 5 are they ready for a trial of extubation and, and in this you need to know what the neurological status is but if no to the above you need to be asking yourself and the group need to ask why what happens if they're above 0.4? Well, has your examination, if you've done that, or your investigations given you indica any indication as to what's going on? Is there sputum plugging? Is there a pneumothorax? Don't forget secondary infection. Um, these patients will sit for days and days and days, the COVID patient particularly, um, and they have a 
moderate chance of developing a hospital-acquired or ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, and there are other infections that can cause it as well, obviously. What's their fluid balance? I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but the aim in the COVID patient particularly is to keep them slightly drier, i.e. their negative side of their fluid balance for a 24 hour period. And if they're above 0.4, a trial of increasing their PEEP to increase alveolar recruitment may be appropriate. What happens if they're really starting to get sick and their FI2 is above 0.6? Well, first thing I'd be thinking about is asking someone else their advice as well. Um, but a trial of higher PEEP again may be appropriate. Um, a muscle relaxant, if you haven't been using it, and even an infusion like cisatricurium may be appropriate. Consider proning early. Um, now, not a lot of Australian intensive cares will do proning as a routine um, or as a, I should say, as a regular event. Um, and we're all, well, certainly in my workplaces, we're frankly upskilling everyone in the ability to prone patients because a lot of us won't have done much of it since, uh, since the swine flu 2009. Consider alternate modes of ventilation. Um, there are various modes such as bi-level and APRV. If you're not familiar with these though, I wouldn't go playing with them until you can get some help on those. Um, but it's important to know, does your workplace, does your ICU offer ECMO? And if not, and you, and you think the patient may need ECMO, what is the referral service? What is the, the way of getting your patient um, reviewed for ECMO? And get familiar with that quickly. What number do you need to call? What hospital it is, is it? Because you may need to call fairly rapidly. Hopefully not. Hopefully you can predict this well before, but it may be that in that, in, that may be the, the case. So open lung ventilation, protective lung ventilation strategy is the, the catchphrase when it comes to ARDS management. Um, and the ARDS net um, were one of the big drivers of this over 10 years ago. Um, and since then we've opted for relatively higher peeps um, and relatively lower tidal volumes to try and achieve these two aims. Now, rather than me trying to go through in detail what I think is actually really quite an important um, point, and I know I stressed I didn't want to do too much COVID management um, and I want this to be a basic introduction, I really think given that the bulk of the patients you'll probably be managing will be COVID patients, I strongly recommend going and looking up a, a source. And I've already put in the title there, the Life and the Fast Loan website, um, and that's the link to their very easy to understand, very simple approach to um, open lung ventilation. Um, but I put the table up there just to give you a pictorial of some of the ways you can manage your PEEP versus your FiO2. Um, but as I say, this is a really important point and I'd even pause the video and go and look at it now. So circulation. In general, we're aiming for a map, if anything slightly slower than normal in the COVID patients, slightly lower um, than, the COVID, uh, than the normal patient. But my arbitrary number would be a map greater than 65. There are things that will vary that, such as where they've got long history of high blood pressure. Um, but if you can, above 60 to 65. And as I said before, a neutral or a negative fluid balance. Most of the reports, articles, evidence coming out of countries that are well ahead of us in the coronavirus era suggest that a slightly negative fluid balance is a better way to go. And that most, most intensive, so I think I could be fair to say, would practice that when you have a patient with ARDS. Noradrenaline, well, you all know noradrenaline, you all know adrenaline, ephedrine. As you know, noradrenaline is uh, the intensivist's favorite vasopressor. Um, but what happens if it's climbing? What happens if it's starting to get really high? Um, you know, above 20, 30, 40 mics per minute. Well, check technical issues is the first thing. I'm sure you're well familiar with doing this, but uh, you'd be surprised at how often a technical issue will be a reason why the blood pressure is rising. Treat as though it's a poor blood pressure in the patient, but think of your technical issues. What's your mandatory ventilation doing? What are the pressures are at? Um, have you excluded barotrauma? Should you be using another vasopressor, such as vasopressin? Now, there are some articles out there from years ago that suggest vasopressin doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, but I'd still say consider it once you're getting above 20 or 30 mics uh, per kilo. Um, sorry, 20 per minute. Um, steroids, um, the evidence is certainly not there at the moment for using high dose steroids, um, unless the patient has true severe septic shock and even then it is still somewhat controversial or there is still a little bit of equipoise. Um, but low dose may be appropriate if you think the patient is hyperadrenal. Consider secondary sepsis, either from the chest or elsewhere. 
as I said before, with hospital and ventilator associated pneumonias. Um, these patients are still prone to getting a secondary sepsis. But most importantly enough, uh, most importantly, please don't forget to think about the types of shock. Um, you can be the smartest doctor in the world, you can be a middle of the range doctor like myself, and still not think about these things at the time. Go and check the troponin, the ECG, have they had an echo for that day? Um, do you need to do some continuous cardiac output monitoring or central venous sats or lactate? What is it doing? Is there a pump failure? Is there an obstructive failure? Or is there simply a lack of fluids because you've got them a little bit too negative? So fluid balance, we talked about that. If they're not on the negative side of the fluid balance, um, consider adding in some diuretics, and most of us will start with furosemide. Um, there are obviously a lot of others out there and the reasons why you may or may not use them. Um, but consider doubling the current dose if they're still not responding, um, you still haven't got them negative. Don't forget about the side effects of furosemide and, and the complications, um, ototoxicity being one of them if you give too big a dose, particularly too quickly. Um, continuous renal replacement therapy uh, for acute kidney injury may need to be considered. Now, for the COVID patients, um, there doesn't seem to be a, a particularly high rate of renal replacement therapy required for them, but there are still some. If you're thinking about this, my advice is talk to one of the intensivists on the unit um, to get his or her advice about it. Sedation. Probably the single biggest question to ask when someone's sedated with a tubing is can it be weaned? And ideally, if you're doing this, you want the FI2 to be less than 0.4. But even if not, you still need to consider, consider a daily sedation break. Can you cease longer acting agents? If you are looking to wean the sedation, consider halving the propofol and the opioids every four hours. Now, I know that's not how it would be done in theatre, um, but we do tend to go moderately slowly with these patients, unless you're thinking about actually extubating the patient, in which case you obviously have to go a lot more rapidly. Exposure, um, I put this in there because I like having E after my A, B, C, D, um, but don't forget to check your lines. And I'll come on, I'll, I'll mention this point a couple of times again. Don't forget to check your lines. And if there's any evidence of cellulitis or you've got an unexplained temperature that doesn't fit within any other sepsis, sepsis category or other pathology, or if the line is greater than somewhere between seven to 14 days, and again, your hospital will have different time frames on what they think is too long for a line to stay in, um, but particularly if the line's no longer needed, consider taking it out. Uh, research. <clears throat> I'm just putting this in here briefly. Um, I'll mention it in the fast hugs algorithm later on. Um, but there are a lot of research, um, research papers, research uh, articles being done at the moment in ICU as they are in other places. Um, and I suggest that you need to find out fairly quickly if they're still going to be continuing. And if they are, what can you do to help them um, continue? Uh, during this COVID era, because it's going to get very, very busy, but we don't want to leave these um, these trials in the dust if they are still continuing. Uh, Remap cap is a severe community acquired pneumonia um, research that will probably be being wound out through intensive cares. Um, I'm still not sure how that's going to go with coronavirus. So again, when you get into your unit, have a have a talk to the people who are in charge of research as to whether or not it's continuing. Nutrition. No one is going to get better properly unless they get good nutrition. There are lots of arguments about enteral versus parenteral. The short version is if you can go enteral, go enteral. Um, something like two cow um, feeding nasogastrically is ideal. Don't forget the bowels. If they have an open, start appearance. And strongly think about a dietitian review if you've got any concerns. So I mentioned this before about family and home team updates, but I'm going to stress it again. You have to do it. Uh, on your ward round, maybe not, but certainly afterwards when you allocate tasks, you have to do a family update, um, but importantly, a home team update as well, because they may get grumpy if you don't, but more importantly, they have some really, really good management themselves to offer for their patient, um, and ignoring the, ignore that at your peril. So investigations, there'll be a whole bunch of investigations. The short version of this is you need to review them. You can't just ignore them. There are a few that uh, may or may not be being used in your hospital during the COVID era. <coughs> excuse me, and uh, they, they're things like LDH, uh, troponin more regularly than just for heart failure, um, looking for myocarditis and other things. Uh, and uh, I'll also mention that don't forget the, the more uncommon tests in ICU, um, things like beta ACG and the young um, female population, don't forget it. Uh, the last thing you want to be doing is discovering uh, first trimester a week after they've been ventilated. Look at your ECG um, and don't forget to look at your imaging. 
So I've put this up here, fast hugs. Most of you will be familiar with the term. Um, a lot of hospitals in their ICUs will have this down on paper somewhere or on a computer somewhere for you to fill in. Um, if you want to, you can pause the talky bit at the moment, have a look through this. But uh, I stress that these are actually really, really important housekeeping things to do for your patient. And they'll make a huge difference to the patient's outcome. And most of them are heavily backed by trials to um, support their use. But I'm gonna emphasize D for drug chart review. It's very easy on a busy ward round to brush over the drug chart. I can't stress enough, take at least a few extra minutes and or get your juniors to help you or your pharmacist if you've got one and review it. Have a buddy with you reviewing it uh, because the number of mistakes that are made on drug charts um, is very, very high and it's very easy to address them if you do a proper drug chart review. So what about end of life care and goals of care? So as I've stressed twice already, this is the most important part, um, I think, of any ICU management of any patient, coronavirus or otherwise. Where possible, I like to have three parties or three advocates for the patient. And one may be the patient themselves, and if not, their family member who is medical power of attorney or at least the next of kin. One is the home team, particularly in the non-coronavirus patient. Uh, and one is yourself or the ICU team. Um, you need to come up with a consensus of what's in the best interest of, that, of the patient in front of you. Um, often you'll have the right answer, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is going to be the answer you proceed with. But you need to have some form of consensus with those three parties if you can. If you're not sure, seek a second opinion. Get an intensivist or someone else to give you their view as well um, on how to proceed. And I'm going to stress this as well. Goals of care are not a single static decision when the patient first comes in, into hospital and then set and forget. They are dynamic. And it may well be that you need to even change them over the course of a single day or even an hour as new information comes to light. So I can't stress enough, don't use them as a single point and then forget about them. So just a little bit on COVID. It is constantly changing, and whatever I tell you now is probably well outdated by the time you watch this or read this, um, but PPE is essential. If you haven't done much practice, if your hospital hasn't got uh, PPE practicing um, up in place now, you need to be doing it now. Uh, aerosol generating procedures, uh, particularly airway intubation, extubation, and I'll underline extubation there as well. Um, you need to be thinking, how are you going to manage those? Where's the patient gonna be? What PPE are you going to be wearing? The DHHS in Victoria certainly gives some guidelines on what sort of PPE to use, um, but make sure you've got some form of policy, even if it's informal in your hospital, and even if it's a small hospital before you get too far down the coronavirus pathway. Ventilation, so I've already mentioned ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, and the open lung, protective lung strategies we use. Again, read up on this is my advice, because that is probably the single most important clinical medical management you will need to do for these patients. Amongst everything else you'll be doing, that's the one you want to be good at. Um, in that ventilation part, proning. Now, as, as I've already mentioned, uh, a lot of places don't regularly prone. Um, we don't often see patients in the numbers we need to to make it something we're good at. Some places do, but certainly in my workplaces, we don't do it frequently. So I'll ha have some links at the end of this presentation on one source, um, one idea of how to do proning make sure it fits in with your hospital or find the version that fits in with your hospital and practice it if you've got time. Um, I can't stress this enough, the more you practice something like proning, the simpler it will be for when you have to do it in the heat of the moment. And I shouldn't do anecdotes on a presentation, but I still remember being an ICU registrar during the swine flu epidemic. And I still remember having to prone a patient at 3 a.m. by myself and two nurses and not knowing what I was doing with no policy and no senior backup. So please practice it. Uh, and ALS you will have potentially code blues called within the unit. You will certainly have METs and codes called on the wards of your hospital. Um, and you need to have some idea of how you're going to proceed with these codes. For example, most places are now instituting out no PPE, no C, as in no C the patient. That includes in a code blue situation. Um, where's the equipment gonna be when you're in a code? Where's the crash cart? Outside the room or inside? Um, how many staff members do you want in the room at any one time? How is your runner or your people outside the room going to pass information and pass equipment? So have a think about that. Have a read up on your local policies. So these three slides I'm going to quickly flick through 
Uh, I think these ones are now out of date by a few days, and I think they have put some updated ones on the DHHS for Victoria. But again, look at your own hospital policies, and if not, look at your Department of Health for your state or territory um, and get some downloaded quickly and put them up. So this is obviously the P2N95 mask fitment, uh, Donnie. Um, and for us, we've, we've changed this long since um, with a few bits of extra bits and pieces in there. Uh, and doffing, particularly doffing, we've now even got the gloves and the, and the, um, the gown come off together. Um, but having said that, go and read up about this because this is probably the most important part of your own protection, your own safety during this era. Now, ANZIC's COVID-19 guidelines came out mm, a couple of weeks ago. Absolutely essential to read if you want to read a Bible. They are very, very good. Um, and one of my colleagues who is much smarter than me um, has managed to do a mind map of it. Um, and I believe they've been endorsed by ANZICs, but don't quote me on that. Um, but certainly this is a really good um, one-page summary of them. And I, I acknowledge that on this slide, it's going to be hard for you to read all this, um, but hopefully we'll be able to provide a link to that as well. And then these are some of the links I've got for you. So in Victoria, the DHHS has got daily, if not hourly updates. I'm sure most of you will have already started reading up um, on DHHS multiple times. Um, but if you haven't, I can't stress enough, um, in your own state or territory, have a look at these uh, and, and start getting familiar with how to navigate the web page quickly to get the information you want. I mentioned the ANZICS COVID guidelines, so this is the, uh, the link to that. Um, it's, I can't remember how many pages it is. It's a moderately long read, but it, everything in there, I think, is very, very valid. Having said that, it is a couple of weeks old now, and there may be a few things that have changed, um, certainly at a local um, geographic area where you're working. Now, I mentioned proning as being one of the most important things um, from a ventilation strategy point of view. You will end up having to prone patients, I would suggest, if we end up with the, the surge, the storm that we're expecting. Um, and these four videos are one way of doing it. I think they're very beautifully shot uh, and have a very succinct and easy way to understand how to prone a patient. Now, what if you want to know more about COVID? I've only touched briefly on it with some of the ward round things I've mentioned and some of the basics. Um, my wife was sent this link and I've had a, a quick listen to it. Um, and it's not a bad one. I think from memory it's UK. Um, but uh, it is one update on coronavirus. There will be many more since and I'm sure you've already got links yourself. Number five is intensive care at night. I see at night, I see at N. Um, one of my colleagues developed this years ago. It's primarily designed for residents first entering ICU. Um, he does, I think it does charge a few dollars and he has made the promise that anyone who buys it, he'll shout them a coffee to, uh, to pay them back. So this is not meant to be a money-making thing, but it is one example of a really nice, simple app you can have for your phone that you can, sim that you can enter all sorts of things and find out how to manage the low urine output in the patient, how to manage anything you care to think of will be on that app. Very easy to use, very user-friendly. And then I think it's important to have a resource for a lot of coronavirus things outside of the anaesthetic webinar. Um, and this one is a bit American. I've seen a couple more since. Um, but find a source, probably not more than one source that you go to for your medical management updates of coronavirus. Now, maybe your local hospital has one. Uh, but if not, there are a lot coming out, particularly out of UK and US at the moment. <coughs> so thank you for ASA for allowing me to do this. Um, I'm hoping to post this in general as well for a lot of other people to view. Um, and I love this photo at the end. I'm assuming that the ASA emblem is holding a cup of coffee, which is what I shall now go and do. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please direct them uh, to the links provided um, on the ASA. And if you're watching this elsewhere, um, ask your local intensive care group. They'll answer them. Thank you very much for watching and listening.